everyone. My name is Colin Harris. I'm the executive director of Take Me Outside. Uh, we're really excited for today's chat with Dr. Goodall, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you. Yesterday was Take Me Outside Day, and we had close to, to 400,000 students and teachers across the country head outdoors to help raise awareness about the importance of learning outside and, and just gen more generally spending more time outside. Uh, it's such an important message these days, and, and you help spread that message loud and clear. So thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Farheen, who is part of the Tame Outside team, and she'll help guide us through the next hour. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, Dr. Goodall, for joining us, and Charlotte as well. Um, hi, my name is Farheen. I'm part of the Take Me Outside team. So Take Me Outside is a not-for-profit organization across Canada. Our mission here is to encourage students and teachers to spend time outdoors and to have that time as a regular part of their everyday learning. I'm joining today from the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe, um, people here in the greater Toronto region. A quick orientation for those of you who just joining us, welcome. Uh, the chat function and the video and mic for all attendees will be turned off. Um, Charlotte and Dr. Goodall will lead us through a Q&A with questions you submitted. So we're really excited for that. And then Charlotte will present on the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada. Um, and then we'll close off with some prizes. One of the prizes is a Chimp Guardian adoption package for one lucky class. All right, so throughout this week to celebrate Take Me Outside Day, we've had various events focusing on different themes related to going outdoors. Today's theme is environmental education, for which outdoor learning is a very important part. Learning hands-on through the environment and nature is an experience we all need, but we don't always get. So as the saying goes, nature is our best teacher and one of the best people who can really help drive home that message through their own experience in the outdoors is a very special guest who we have here with us today. 60 years ago, Jane Goodall first set foot on the shores of what is today Tanzania's Gombe National Park to begin her pioneering study of chimpanzee behavior. For six decades, her research has transformed scientific perceptions about the relationships between humans and animals. And now her mission has evolved and grown into a quest to inspire, empower, and motivate others to make the world a better place. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and United Nations Messenger of Peace, Dr. Jane Goodall. I'm sure there's a round of applause going on around the country right now. Um, also here with us for this presentation is Charlotte from the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada, who will be discussing the JGI programs in schools across the country, and specifically how you can get your school involved in these programs. So welcome Charlotte and Dr. Goodall. I will now pass it over to you both to take it away with your brilliant words. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Farheen and Dr. Jane. It truly is so wonderful to have you here today. For everyone at home or in class, as Farheen mentioned earlier, my name is Charlotte Burke, and I'm the Roots and Shoots Manager at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada. I am beyond thrilled to be your host for this discussion and, Ro and Roots and Shoots presentation for Take Me Outside Day 2021. Dr. Jane, there are actually over 400,000 people participating in this year's event. How incredible is that? Well, we've got a lot of questions for you today, some of which are from the audience, so let's jump on in. In celebration of Take Me Outside Day 2021, participating classrooms spent some time this week learning about the importance of exploring, learning, and playing outside. So on that theme, what were your experiences like learning outside as a young girl, and how did that influence your career as an adult? Uh, well, the thing is, I was born loving animals. I don't know where it came from. People keep saying, what triggered it? I don't know. I was watching earthworms and wondering apparently how they walk without legs when I was one and a half years old. And fortunately, I had a very supportive mother who didn't get mad at me because I put earthworms in bed with me, things like that. And so when I was growing up, there was no TV. 
you have to it's it's hard for young people to comprehend that no social media nothing like that so for me it was it was books from which i could learn about animals but most of all outside we've got a big garden here i'm speaking to you from my childhood home where i've been since the pandemic began and we got a big garden i used to spend hours out in the garden i found a special tree beach who's still out there much bigger now and i used to take my homework up there i used to take books up there i used to take my secrets up there i used to spend hours feeling closer to the birds in the sky i used to spend hours watching a bird's nest getting them used to me so that i could see the eggs hatch and the parents feed the babies and the babies take their first flight i kept caterpillars and watched them eat grow big form cocoons or pupa and then emerge as butterflies so my entire childhood was learning outside and i so understand the importance of this outside learning also the first school i went to we had nature walks every single week I absolutely love that. And I think that it, nature walks are so important. And I think that's perfectly on theme with, with what we're talking about today and the importance of getting outside. That's amazing. And I think it's all a lot of, a lot of it is curiosity driven as well, which is incredible. And something we certainly encourage all youth is to follow their curiosity and learn more about the outdoors. Your education has largely happened in the field experientially. And of course, certainly there's a time and place for students learning in a structured environment at school and in their desks, but can our students learning shift beyond four walls and a desk? I think it must. I think it's desperately important. I've seen the impact that it makes. And I'll never forget uh, the first time we brought groups of our youth program, Roots and Shoots, together from around America. Um, we were asked if we would include a group of local children. And it was a very impoverished area. The children were African-American and the leader was 18 years old and he was quite hostile. We were a bit upset that we, we just had to, you know, include this group. But when we took them on the river and this young man used a net and scooped little things out of the water, his expression changed. He'd never seen anything like this before. He was absolutely amazed. And we took him on a boat and we passed the nest of a swan with her signets. And he changed so much that whereas he started rather hostile and he didn't want to be there any more than we were, I was kind of worried about him being there. He then invited me back and my schedule wasn't so packed in those days. So he took me to three local schools and we started our youth program, Roots and Shoots, there. So learning outside can change children's lives. It changed mine. It changed his. It changes so many. Absolutely. And I think one of the big teachers from this pandemic we've experienced is how getting outdoors and spending time in nature is so connected to our mental health and well-being and makes us such happier individuals. So I could not agree more with you. We're going to pivot now to focus a little bit more on the incredible work that you've done with chimps, which has spanned over many years. What lessons can humans learn from chimpanzees? Well, <clears throat> when I began, it was uh, really the you know, we call it ethology now, the study of behavior. And animal behavior was only being studied in captivity. And when I decided to go to Africa and live with animals and write books about them, I was 10 years old. There was no thought of being a scientist. I mean, women were not that sort of scientist back then. I was only men who did adventurous things like going and living with wild animals. But again, I have this amazing supportive mother and her message is good today for children around the world, particularly in disadvantaged communities. She simply said, Jane, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, 
you may find a way. And this is what I've said to young people around the world. And so many have said to me, Jane, I want to thank you because you taught me that because you did it, I can do it too. So right from the beginning, when I was 10, I knew what I wanted to do and lots of young people don't. But I was fortunate, I did know, and I did manage to get there. And it was not my goal to study chimpanzees. I mean, they were exotic. Nobody had studied them in the world. Nobody knew anything much about them. Few captive studies. And I was fortunate to hear about and then meet Dr. Lewis Leakey, famous paleontologist, anthropologist. And it was he who offered me the opportunity to go and live not with just any animal, the one most like us, the chimpanzee. Well, it took four months before they stopped running away from me. They're very conservative. But finally, you know, I gained their trust and I was able to start documenting their behavior, which is so like ours. So what I learned was, yes, Lewis was surely right when he reckoned that about six million years ago, there was an ape-like human-like creature from which chimpanzees on the one hand, humans on the other have evolved. And the one thing that really stands out, I mean, yes, they behave like us in so many ways, they even have a kind of primitive war, but they also have love, compassion, and altruism. Males compete for dominance, swaggering, bristling, looking as fierce and intimidating as they possibly can, just like some human male politicians. I hate to say it, but a few female politicians too. And the bonds between mothers and their family, not just mother and infant, but going up to mothers with their adult sons and daughters. And gestures like kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting on the back. I mean, all of these are so similar to us. But it enables you to stand back and say, yes, they're so like us. We share 98.7% of our DNA with them even, but we're different. What's the big difference? That's what I was and then able to determine the big difference, the explosive development of our intellect. And, you know, I mean, I think right now you've got a full moon out there or close to a full moon. And I would encourage every child listening, if you are lucky enough to have clear skies and you can look up at that moon, just feel that wonder and awe when you think humans walked up there. Today it's taken for granted. Yeah, there was a moon landing. I mean, we even got rockets going to Mars. But when I first saw that moon landing, it was science fiction come true. And I look up at that moon and I feel that same wonder and awe. Wow, people walked up there on that moon. We forget wonder and awe. We just take things for granted. We have to learn not to take, we have to learn to think about what we've done with amazement. And so, this big difference between us chimps and other animals. I think personally, it was in part anyway, triggered by the fact that we developed this way. We're communicating with each other, language, with words. And for the first time, we could teach our children uh, about things that weren't there. Whereas the chimpanzee children, they learn by observing and imitating. Language enabled us to learn lessons from the distant past, to make plans for the distant future. Above all, to bring people together from different, uh, from different lifestyles to try and find problems to solutions. That was beautiful. There were so many pieces of information and, and ideas and advice and lessons that you've learned. And I think one that really spoke to me is the power of community and the importance of not taking this world that we have for granted. So thank you so much for sharing those insights. The next question we have is from the Edmund Partridge School, grade seven class from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And they would like to know, what were some of your favorite moments with chimpanzees? It's rather difficult after so many years, but clearly 
the first moment when chimpanzees who'd been running away from me for four months, and I only had money for six months, and I came by mistake too close. I'd seen this group on the other side of a steep ravine, and I thought, ah, if I can get to that tree, I'll be able to be not too close, and I'll be relatively concealed and be able to watch them. But I made a mistake, and I got too close. So I was waiting for them to run away as usual. They looked at me, and they went back to grooming each other. And it was the most amazing moment. It was etched on my mind forever. But then there were other moments, like seeing David Greybeard using pieces of grass and leafy twigs with the leaves peeled off to use as tools to fish for termites. There was the moment when old Flo, the matriarch, had been really afraid of me, but when she gained trust to such an extent that she allowed her little five-month-old infant Flint to come right up to me. She kept a hand around him. She had a worried expression on her face, but she let him come and he reached out and touched my nose, looking up with those big, wide eyes. Wonder. That was those memories are etched on my mind forever. That's beautiful. And it seems like Flo had a little bit of his own chimpanzee discovery, learning about how close chimpanzees were to humans by touching your nose that way. I love that. And I love the story of David Greybeard as well. Um, and on the power of chimpanzees and, and how much you've been able to learn from them and how close we are related to them. We have a question here from the grade four or five class out of Milton, Ontario. And they would like to know if chimpanzees went extinct, how would this affect the world and their ecosystems? And what are some actions that students can take to stop this from happening in our own backyards? Well, first of all, chimpanzees are known as great gardeners because their main food or the food they like best are fruits. And um, so they eat these fruits and a lot of the seeds and stones go through their digestive tracts and come out in their, in their poo. And this is because they travel quite long distances, it's helping to spread these seeds uh, throughout the forest for regeneration purposes. And of course, the dung that surrounds the seed is, is good to fertilize it. So they're, they're great gardeners. And uh, what can we do to save them? Well, of course, the Jane Goodall Institute is, is working really, really hard with the local people in several different African countries to help save the chimps from extinction, to help protect their habitat. And what you can do in Canada is you can become a chimpanzee guardian. And that means it can help us look after the orphan chimps whose mothers have been killed in the bushmeat industry. That's the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. And unfortunately, in some African countries, chimpanzee meat is prized. So because it's illegal, the government will allow us to confiscate the infants and then we have to care for them in sanctuaries. But you can also, you know, within the Roots and Shoots program, learn more about the situation. And maybe there will be occasions when you can write to your legislators. Maybe you can think about one day coming out to help in the study to learn more about chimps and to help protect their environment. Absolutely. And on the note of Roots and Shoots, uh, you often talk about the power of young people and how it inspires you. And so after creating this program of Roots and Shoots, which is celebrating its 30th year this year, uh, that helps youth take action in their communities, we would love to hear more about the Roots and Shoots program from your perspective. Well, it was um, in when I, when I had left Gombe to travel around the world, to talk to people about the problems faced by the chimpanzees, you know, the destruction of the forest, the bushmeat trade and so on. And I was then traveling around the world talking about this and I was meeting so many young people who seemed to have lost hope. And when I talked to them, and these were in different continents, they all said more or less the same. Well, we feel like this, which was depressed or angry or just 
mostly actually, just apathetic, not seeming to care. We feel this way because you've harmed our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, if any of the young people listening today feel that older generations have harmed your future, you are absolutely right. We haven't just harmed it, we've been stealing it from you. We still are. But when the young people said to me, there's nothing we can do about it, I thought, no, that's not true. We still got a window of time when we can turn things around. And so uh, this little group that came to me in Dar es Salaam, there were 12 high school students from eight different high schools. And they came to ask my advice about the concerns they had about what was going on around them. And it wasn't just poaching of wildlife. It wasn't just destruction of environment, but it was things like worrying about street children with no homes, worrying about the homeless dogs who had nowhere to go and were being cruelly treated. So I told these 12 students, okay, go and find your friends. And we had a meeting and at that meeting, Roots and Shoots was born, February 1991. And we decided that the main message would be every single individual matters. Every single individual makes an impact every single day. And we get to choose what sort of impact we make. And we decided because everything was interrelated that every Roots and Shoots group would choose, they would choose, not us, not Top Dog, they would choose a project to help animals, a project to help people, and a project to help the environment because it's all interrelated. And of course, in the Roots and Shoots today, which is now in over 60 countries and has members in kindergarten, even some preschoolers, university and everything in between, uh, these, these, uh, these groups are growing all the time and they somehow, as they engage on projects which they choose, they are somehow learning that much more important than the color of our skin, our culture, our language, our religion, is the fact we're all human beings. We all laugh, we all cry, if we fall we bleed, and our blood is the same. So we're learning the young people are learning and they remember it into adult life that we are one human family. Absolutely. That's incredible. And, you know, I love the story about how Roots and Shoots has come together. And I think the amazing thing about this program is that it is entirely youth led. They get to, term to determine where they want to have an impact based on what they know about their community. And I really think that's something so special. Um, in reflecting on how Roots and Shoots is currently in its 30th year, I can't imagine all of the incredible projects you've seen over that time. Is there a particular Roots and Shoots project that comes to mind that has inspired you? Well, um, there's one which is, which is actually more symbolic than anything else, but I love it just because it's symbolic. It was the first group to be formed in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we have our office in Goma, which is where there's oil, um, it's a mineral rich area. So you have groups of militia and they fight each other. And there's often sounds of, of rifle fire and bombs going off as different militia compete to get the minerals. It's not a safe place. But anyway, this first little group of roots and shoots under the mentorship of Dario, there were about 15 of them, I think. They were roughly 10 to 14. And they decided as their first project, they wanted to plant trees on what was once a sacred hill and it had been forested, but now most of the trees had gone. So they wanted to put the trees back. Well, it was actually a sort of more or less impossible thing for them to do, but Dario didn't want to subdue them and you know crush their enthusiasm. So he got some saplings donated by a forester friend of his, but then he had to go to the resident militia to get permission. So the colonel said, well, it's a very stupid idea. They obviously can't do it, these little children, but 
well, I suppose it's not harmless, um, not harmful, but I'll have to send soldiers with you. Can you imagine? Long, hot trek, little kids, 15 of them, carrying their little saplings, and I suppose something to dig with. With them are four big, burly Congolese soldiers with AK-47 rifles over their shoulder. They get there, they're tired, and they start trying to dig holes. The ground's very hard. And the youngest is a little girl of about eight. She begins to cry. She can't make the hole to put her tree in. And after about 10 minutes, one of the soldiers leans his gun against a tree and goes to help her. And within the next 10 minutes, all the soldiers had laid aside their guns and they were helping the children plant trees. And to me, that is a very, very symbolic story because it illustrates what Roots and Shoots is trying to do to respect each other, to reduce violence and warfare, to live in a community of peace and harmony with each other and with the natural world. Dr. Jane, I'm holding back tears over here. That was, that was an incredible story and I think such a, a testament to the indomitable human spirit that you always talk about. Um, well, before we pass the mic back to Farin, uh, to say goodbye to you and jump into the Roots and Shoots presentation, is there anything else you'd like to say to the classes with us today? Well, I'd just like to remind you all that you, as an individual, and I'm talking to each one of you now, you make a difference every day. And you need to think about that. When you go to bed tonight, can you look back over the day and say, well, I think I made things a little bit better? Or maybe that won't be true. But you know, a lot of people feel hopeless and helpless because I'm just one person. The problems of the world are huge. There's nothing I can do. And so people fall into apathy and do nothing. And that's doom for the future. So the point is that though you may feel that picking up plastic or planting a tree or helping a stray animal or whatever it is, doesn't really matter because it's such a small little thing. It's not just you. It's young people all over the world who are doing these kind of projects. So that this saying, which I hear all the time, think globally, act locally, should be the other way around. Act locally. Know that other people around the world are also acting locally. And then you all dare think globally that together we are making this a better world. And that's the last word that I would like to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. And with that, we will pass it back to Farin um, and Colin. Thank you so much for having us. Dr. Goodall, thanks so much. It's uh, thanks for being with us today. And you've given us a lot to think about. I really love sort of your use of storytelling to, to sort of make a point. And I, th I think the students listening today and the teachers have a lot to, to reflect on. So thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe before I cut off um, to go to my next Zoom meeting, uh, maybe I should give the chimpanzee distance greeting to everyone. And then later on, you can all practice it. But it, we are all at a distance. We're talking from different places. Chimpanzees travel around in small groups. The community splits up. They want to keep contact with each other. So they have this distance call, which is <laughs> and each one has his or her own individual call. So when you hear that sound, you know who's there and you can find friends that you may have lost contact with. So that was me. That was Jane. And with that sound, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodall. Your tireless research and support for outdoor learning um, makes a huge impact um, on students all across Canada today. And it was an absolute pleasure to host you and be a part of this discussion. So with that, um, that ends our time with Dr. Goodall for the event. Thank you from Take Me Outside, um, our outdoor learning partners and our audience across Canada. Bye. Um, the rest of you, please stick around because Charlotte from the Jane Goodall Institute <clears throat> will be talking about how schools can get involved. 
um, and she has great information to share. So don't leave just yet. And we have prizes for you all at the end. So take it away, Charlotte. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm just gonna take a moment here to share my screen with everybody. Fantastic. And there we go. Um, hopefully everybody can see my first presentation slide here uh, on Roots and Shoots. And let's get started. So welcome back everyone. And thank you so much for sticking around. It's always such an honor to hear from Dr. Jane, and I always feel so inspired after an, after an opportunity to hear her speak about her life and the hope that she has for the future. We spent some time today talking about Roots and Shoots, which probably means a lot of you are thinking, what is Roots and Shoots? And hopefully, how do I get involved? So we're gonna sp spend a bit of time now talking about Roots and Shoots in Canada and how you can take action to make the world a better place right in your home community. We'll start with a quick introduction of some of the amazing work of my teammates at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada. We'll dive into the Roots and Shoots program and how you can get involved to make a difference. And then I'll introduce you to 8Fund, which is where youth can access online tools, resources, and funding for their Roots and Shoots projects. A quick note that as you go, or as we go, you'll probably see some amazing photos of Dr. Jane some of which she'll be interacting with wildlife such as chimpanzees. It's super important to remember that wildlife are best observed from a safe, respectable distance. And as you all learn, explore and play outdoors, we encourage you to observe wildlife from afar for the safety of both you and the animals themselves. Let's jump in. Awesome. The Jane Goodall Institute of Canada is part of a global community conservation organization that continues the work of the lovely Dr. Jane Goodall, who we just had the pleasure of speaking with. We have global offices all over the world in over 30 countries and programs in more than 60 countries. Our mission is to honor Jane's legacy of hope through action by mobilizing widespread movements addressing the convergence of three global crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental inequity in support of communities in Canada and Sub-Saharan Africa. All of our offices are driven by the belief that by protecting chimpanzees and inspiring people to value and protect the natural world we all share, that we improve the lives of all people, animals, and the environment around us. We do some pretty amazing work at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada. I have an incredible team and our partners and programs are arguably even cooler. Our first pillar of work is focused on community-centered conservation, which focuses on empowering communities and partnering with them in order to foster conservation efforts through elements such as water sanitation, reforestation, and sustainable agriculture. We also work with our partners to support two sanctuaries for orphan chimpanzees, one in the Republic of Congo and another in South, South Africa. We also love to continue Dr. Jane's work in scientific discovery, which includes researching chimpanzee behavior that is leading the way in conservation science and technological innovation. And lastly, we know that the biggest titans of change for the future are within young people like you all over the world. Our global humanitarian and environmental program, Roots and Shoots, works to educate and empower youth all over the world to lead hands-on projects that help people, animals, and the environment. I was not kidding either. Roots and Shoots is literally all over the world, from coast to coast in Canada, to Australia, China, Taiwan, Chile, Germany, India, Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States, and everywhere in between, over 60 countries. But what is now a giant program started all the way back in 1991, when only 12 Tanzanian high school students that wanted to make in their, a change in their community worked with Jane to do so. And thus the first Roots and Shoots group was born. This year, we're celebrating 30 years of Roots and Shoots, which is hard to believe sometimes. In Canada, over the last two years, we've supported over 150 projects through our eight fund grants, which were led collectively by over 12,000 youth across Canada and involved an additional 35,000 youth. And it's incredibly easy to participate too. 
It's only four steps and focuses on where you feel like you can make a difference in your own community. Anyone can participate too. We have youth from pre-kindergarten all the way up to 30 years old and sometimes even older participating in Roots and Shoots projects. So what does Roots and Shoots look like in Canada? Our team follows something called the One Health Approach, which essentially boils down to an understanding that all people, all animals, and the environment are deeply interconnected with one another. And this idea is not a secret either. Uh, many people, especially First Nations, Inui, and Métis peoples from coast to coast to coast have long understood the interconnectedness between all living and non-living beings. This year, we have begun to integrate these diverse perspectives into the core fabric of our programming for all Roots and Shoots projects in order to center and amplify Indigenous perspectives and voices into climate action as they are the original stewards of these lands. And while the ideas of equity and biodiversity and climate change might seem complex or scary or confusing, you'd be amazed to see that all of our Roots and Shoots projects are already helping all people, animals, and the environment around them in some way, whether the youth leading the projects know it or not. Take, for example, a community sustainable food garden. The food produced helps the people in, commu in the community access fresh, healthy, local food. The plants in the garden clean the air and provide us with oxygen, just like the trees do, and help to clean and green our environment. And the garden is also home to many insects like pollinators and other critters and plant species, providing them with nutrients and shelter, which is helping biodiversity and animals. And for anyone who doesn't know, biodiversity is just a fancy science word for the variety of all living things. This just goes to show how interconnected we all are with the world around us and how much we depend on animal biodiversity and a healthy environment to help us the people live long, healthy lives. And a little bit, and to speak a little bit more about the interconnectedness between all people, animals, and the environment, here is a quick video from Dr. Jane about how we all depend on one another. It's been an amazing journey, this life of mine. This planet has filled me with the wonder of all living things, great and small. We cannot ignore this earth that surrounds us, that feeds us, shelters us, replenishes our bodies and our souls, and stretches our imaginations, where animals, plants, air, water, all care for us. We're all interconnected. People, animals, our environment. When nature suffers, we suffer. And when nature flourishes, we all flourish. I do believe in the possibility of a world where we can live in harmony with nature, but only if every one of us does our part to make that world a reality. So that when you look back over your journey, your life, you can truly say, I did make a difference. absolutely love that video, uh, not only because it shows us how we all need one another to survive on this planet that we call home, but also because the music is so beautiful and so relaxing. So I mentioned earlier that the core of Roots and Shoots involves four major steps. So now we're going to take some time to dive into each one. So the first step of Roots and Shoots is to get engaged and inspired. Ask yourself who or what inspires me to be a leader and to take action to help people, animals, and the environment. I can think of tons of people in my life that inspire me every day, but today I'm gonna to talk about a few from our Youth Advisory Council. Their hard work and tireless dedication inspires me every day to be the best leader I can possibly be. In fact, they inspire me so much, I'm gonna tell you about four of them. Hannah comes from the remote farming community of Tisdale, Saskatchewan, which only has 3,200 people in it. She grew up on a small grain farm and spends tons of time outdoors. She's most inspired by moss and lichens, which are tiny little plant-like structures that make their homes on trees, rocks, and other forest surfaces. 
Chloe hails from Windsor, Ontario, and is currently studying wildlife biology and conservation at the University of Guelph. She also really enjoys spending her spare time outdoors, and she is a phenomenal bird watcher. She's also an incredible artist, and she's so good at drawing, and she loves to play video games as well. The third person I'm going to tell you about is Kristen. Kristen is from Markham, Ontario, and is now on her second year of the council. She loves spending time outdoors as well, as you can see from her photo, uh, which includes watching outdoor live theater, which I think is so unique and so incredible, and she really loves musicals. The last person from our Youth Advisory Council that I'll tell you about is Asala. Asala is from Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, and she's now studying at the University of British Columbia on Musqueam territory. She loves hiking, photography, and yoga, and has a passion to use her love of imagery and storytelling to educate others and inspire action. All of us are incredibly energized by emerging generations and their dedication to tackling some of planet Earth's biggest challenges. And we are so happy and so fortunate to have them on our Youth Advisory Council. And of course, Dr. Jane. Everyone knows the wonderful Dr. Jane Goodall. At the young age of 26, with no science or animal behavior training, Jane got the rare opportunity to study chimpanzees in his, what, what is now Gombe National Park in the East African country of Tanzania. Using patience and her own intuition, Jane discovered features about chimpanzees that in many ways changed our view of mankind and our connection to the animal world. Her remarkable findings led her to now speak at different events 300 days a year prior to the pandemic, discussing threats facing chimpanzees, species conservation, and reasons for hope that we will ultimately solve some of Earth's biggest problems. Now she's able to participate in events digitally as we saw today, which has actually allowed her to broaden her reach and spread her message to more people around the world. The second step of Roots and Shoots is to observe the needs of your community to determine what issues you can tackle right at home. And you can do this in a number of different ways. This can be done by conducting a community walk in your neighborhood or using digital tools such as Google Maps or Google Earth to see where you can have an impact right at home. On the left, you'll see that you can do conduct a digital community mapping exercise using those tools like Google Maps and like Google Earth, which is a safe way to explore your community during something like a COVID-19 lockdown that we're all very familiar with. Another really cool way to map your community is to use your community. You can grab sticks, twigs, leaves, and rocks and map your community right out on the ground in front of you. Ultimately, it's not about what you use to map your community, it's about what you find. And once you've had the chance to explore and learn more about your community, safely of course, you'll wanna keep note of the things that inspired you to make a change. You can create a community scorecard like you want the one you see on the screen here, or you can discuss your findings with your friends and family and peers. And this will allow you to determine what you wanna build your project on. It's a fantastic way also to spend some time outdoors, exploring your neighborhood safely with friends and family and learning more about your neighborhoods and homes and communities. So now I'm gonna take a moment to show you how some students in Hong Kong conducted their own community mapping exercise. This was done prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So however you do your own exploring, you'll make, you wanna make sure you do it safely. find what was wrong uh, with the neighborhood and um, to ask maybe how people felt about it. Yeah. We went to observe things in our, in our community in Guangzhou and we, we, uh, we also got, tried to interview some locals to try and get to find out what, what was happening in our community and what we needed to, what we need to fix in our community. Uh, well, not right now we're, map we're making a map, um, so where we're putting all the problems we, fa we found onto a Google map. We can send it to people to let them know that this is where we found some problems, so maybe they could help um, fix these problems. Well, it was quite surprising yeah, because 
Um, but I, I actually know some of those things, like that, that one where the sign was pointing the wrong way, like oh, I've yeah, gone yeah. off that road so many times and I've actually never seen it. When you just like look out the window, you never realize the small problems. Yeah. But when once you actually um, de are determined to do it and you just walk around, you yeah. can actually see that there are a lot of things that we can work on and fix. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So the key thing to remember here is that often we don't notice issues in our neighborhoods that we can have a positive change on until we actually go out and have a look, which is why the community mapping exercise is so important. And of course, at the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada, we do enjoy doing a little bit of mapping ourselves. So here's a quick snapshot of some of our Roots and Shoots projects in Canada over the last few years. And on each pin here that you can see on the screen includes a project description, some photos, some more information and details about what was achieved in each project. And this allows Roots and Shoots projects across the country to see what other youth are doing from coast to coast to coast and help inspire one another. So now it's step three. This is the big step. You've taken all of your learnings and you, now you wanna determine how you wanna have a change by taking action with a community project. And you can do this in many different ways. This can include restoring your local community green spaces and natural areas. It can include planting a pollinator or medicine or sustainable food garden, or perhaps restoring a local park or watershed through planting trees or cleaning up. It can be educating those around you about local sustainability issues by talking to your friends and family and peers about the issue that you'd identified and teaching them about why it's important. You might also want to motivate your peers to reflect on or change the way that they can be more sustainable in ways that are accessible to them. And that can be through by showing them ways that they can help fix that issue. And then, of course, Jane mentioned advocating by writing a letter to local legislators or just speaking with decision makers in your community to raise awareness about your cause. And so that can be bringing your problem to policymakers, government officials, business owners, and other decision makers to show why helping them helping you implement your solution is so important. The opportunities here really are endless and you can take your project in any direction that you'd like. So in order to get started, you'll wanna plan ahead and reflect on some questions that you'll need to be successful. You can start with basic questions around you that you'd experienced and identified during your community mapping exercise and the problem that you'd like to tackle with your project. You should think about things like what or who is being impacted by the problem. Is it animals, people, or the environment, or perhaps it's a combination? And then you can determine what you'd like to do to help solve that issue. And you don't need to solve the whole issue right away either. Every individual action counts and matters when making a difference, no matter how big or small. Write a list of things you'll need to start your project. Do you need to do research with books or the internet? Are there experts that you can ask for help? What materials do you need? How long will your project last? And of course, there are always project coordinators around like teachers and educators to help support in designing your projects. And lastly, how will you know if you were successful? Perhaps you'll count the number of plants you were able to grow, the number of people you were able to talk to, the amount of litter you were able to pick up if you were cleaning up a local park or watershed, or did you just spend some time outdoors, which is just as successful? All of these are great ways to think about how amazingly successful your project can be. And so we have a bunch of resources as well that we encourage our Roots and Shoots projects to tap into. The first that I'll tell you about are our online curriculum guides on a number of different subjects. They are chocked full of information, additional resources and classroom activities, and they can all be found on our website, which is always being updated with new content for youth and educators to access. Some of our Roots and Shoots guides include Roots and Shoots at Home, our brand new biodiversity guide, invasive species, sustainable food, protecting our sacred water, and then our new guide that's coming soon, Indigenous Perspectives in Canada, which we are so excited about. And of course, our eight fund community grants. Roots and Shoots projects are welcome to apply each year to receive funding for project activities. This year, our applications will open for the month of November from the 1st to the 30th. 
And then applications are reviewed over the winter break and funds are awarded in early 2022. Throughout the winter and spring, Roots and Shoots projects take place and wrap up before the summer holidays in June, at which point there's a year end report due where you'll tell us about the activities that were accomplished and what was learned from the youth over the course of the project. The ultimate goal of Roots and Shoots is to learn more about how people, animals, and the environment are all connected. And that can be in the simplest, most basic way to as complex as you'd like to make it. And of course, Roots and Shoots is designed to show you how you can make a difference and be a force for change right at home. And of course, it's June now, you've done your Roots and Shoots project, and now it's time to celebrate what you were able to achieve. At JGI Canada, we measure impact by understanding what you were able to learn over the course of the project and how you were able to take action. We also measure your impact through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a guiding framework, but it's also good to do some self-reflection. Ask yourself things like, what did you learn and how did you take action on the issue that you'd identified? Did you learn more about the interconnectedness between animals, people, and the environment? Did you feel like you can continue making a difference after your project is complete? And most importantly, did you have fun? As you plan to celebrate your project, keep in mind that if you did receive an eight fund grant, that you are able to put some of your funds towards your celebration as well to ensure it, it's as ex exciting as possible. And celebrating can look like a number of different things. It can include things like hosting gatherings or get togethers in a safe manner that follows local guidelines and can include things like pit cooks to pizza parties or a Zoom call with your classmates. We encourage you during this time to share stories and laughter and lessons learned along the way. And of course, we want you to continue taking action wherever you can, because as Dr. Jane has always said, every individual matters, every individual has a role to play and every individual makes a difference every day. And so a quick recap on our Roots and Shoots four steps. In step one, you're gonna reflect on who or what inspires you to make change. In your step two, you're going to observe and map out your community and determine where you can have an impact. Step three, you're going to plan a project based on your findings and take action. And then in step four, you're going to reflect on your achievements and celebrate the impact you were able to have. And so a very popular question that we get from a lot of youth is, what are some Roots and Shoots projects that are happening around Canada? So now I'm gonna give you a sneak peek into some of our Roots and Shoots projects that wrapped up this year. So in Terrace Bay, Ontario from Lake Superior High School, the Outdoor Environmental Science class put their eight fund community grant towards a project focus on engaging rural Northern Ontario students in decolonization activities at Pays Platte First Nation. The three day trip involved countless activities such as contributing to a powwow revitalization project, canoeing, camping, sharing food, stories and laughter and participating in cultural learnings from elders on their traditional sacred grounds. And after a year and a half of online learning, the big takeaway is that students realize the beauty of community building and the power of building relationships. On the East Coast in New Brunswick, the 20th Moncton Girl Guides dedicated their Roots and Shoots project to learning more about birds and enriching the habitats of local species. After learning about lo different local bird species, their behaviors and habitat preferences, they got to work alongside the Kodiak Woodworking Guild to build a series of birdhouses of different sizes, shapes, and colors. They also learned where to place the birdhouses and how to care for them to ensure they'd be well loved by local birds for years to come. On the West Coast, the stewards of the Chianu Society created indigenous plant nurseries and now tend to over 5,000 plants. Youth caring for the nurseries were able to engage in a number of ongoing activities and learning experiences. This included harvesting and drying lichens and rose hips and using them to make creams, oils, and other products. The students are beyond excited to continue caring for the nursery for the growing seasons to come. For those of you who love podcasts, Shake of the Establishment, a growing grassroots organization primarily in Southern Ontario, launched their first ever podcast known as Establish. The podcast connects their listeners to a series of experts and individuals with lived experiences working in all areas of climate justice. Their podcast is now widely available on common streaming platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music. 
And last but certainly not least, in Yellowknife, the, nor the Northwest Territories at Mildred Hall School, students got to work tending their on-site community garden, which has been largely volunteer run for the last five years. Now with students at the helm, they're gaining firsthand experience on what it means to connect with the food you grow and what's required to nurture a garden. And by working together throughout the year, students learned more about sustainable food systems and how they could collectively support one another and have a more positive impact on the world around them. And with that, I wanna thank everyone so much for allowing myself and Dr. Jane to spend some time with you this morning or afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from. If you have any questions about our presentation uh, this afternoon on Roots and Shoots, please get in touch with us. A gentle reminder that eight fund applications open in less than two weeks on November 1st and will close on the 30th for those that are interested in applying. I hope you all have had a wonderful week of Take Me Outside Day events and most importantly, continue to spend some time outdoors wherever you're able to learn, explore and play in this beautiful country we call home. And of course, we encourage you to uh, keep in touch with us on social media, wherever you can to learn more about updates on our programming, pro projects and incredible partners. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day, everyone. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for um, providing these students such a great opportunity to learn about the Roots and Shoots program and get involved and be leaders in their community. Um, we're all coming off a great high after the amazing talk by Dr. Jane. Um, so I really hope um, all of these students take advantage of the opportunity that Charlotte has provided um and continue to do your part to help the environment so thanks again to the jane goodall institute of canada um, to charlotte and to dr jane goodall um, all of you for being here with us today uh, we're going to um give away prizes i know a lot of you have been um waiting for that so we first we'd like to thank our partners um canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store for their support throughout take me outside day and Take Me Outside Week events. The Outdoor Learning Store offers supplies for teachers to help them get their students outside. And the link to that is in the chat. We also wanna thank our partner MEC for their continued support. Um, and a link to MEC is also in the chat. The first prize we're gonna give away is um, a Chimp Guardian package um, at the Jane Goodall Institute. So one lucky class will receive a postcard from Dr. Jane, a plush toy chimpanzee, a biography of one of the chimps that you're adopting, and a fact sheet about the sanctuary in the Republic of Congo. So that lucky class is class uh, 51 Echo Forest Trail. So that's the name on Zoom. Um, to claim your prize, please email us at info at takemeoutside.ca and that is in the chat uh, and we'll be in touch with you on how you can get all of those things and adopt your chimpanzee. Uh, the second prize we're giving out is a $50 gift card to the outdoor learning store. And the winner for that is Margot Anderson Boucher. Um, congratulations, please email us and we'll get you that gift card. And the third prize we're giving out is a $50 MEC gift card. Um, and that goes to Miss Cresswell's class. So hope you're still around in the call. Um, congratulations for winning those prizes. Email us and we'll get those to you. Uh, thanks so much to all of you, the audience, for joining us today. We hope all of you have had a great time celebrating Take Me Outside Day yesterday and all the events that we had going on this week. We look forward to seeing your photos and pictures, having fun outdoors. Um, and tomorrow is our day of reflection. So we encourage you to reflect on what Take Me Outside Day was to you and what kind of events um, you did and everything that you learned. Uh, we have pre-recorded activities by Green Learning and a demo on um, a water testing kit by Water Rangers. Both of those are up on our website. And that link will be in the chat in a bit. Um, so check those out. There's ways you can win a water testing kit and also participate in um, some great activities that our partners have suggested. Tonight, we have a webinar with Learning for a Sustainable Future for Educators on how to connect math and sustainability. 
Um, so we hope you reflect on the week's events tomorrow and do some thinking on how you can stay active outdoors. Uh, thank you all again so much for joining us and a big thank you to Charlotte and to the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada um, for sharing all that great knowledge with us today. With that, um, I will end the call. Thanks again, Charlotte. Any last words? <laughs> No, just thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody had a great time playing outside this week. I know that I did a little bit myself and uh, and keep it up. Thank you. Um, it was such a pleasure having you join us today and we hope uh, we can work with you again in the future. Thanks right. so much.